All right, welcome back to another episode, folks. Today I'm here with an old friend, Joe Carey, from 59 Degrees. And Joe is very excited about soil microbiology and compost making, so we're going to have a chat about that today. So Joe, we met in, when was it? Summer of Soil, 2013. 2013. I think 2014 maybe. Joe is <coughs> from Wales, which is an appendage of England, I'd say. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and you were running a pretty successful tree surgeon business, weren't you? And it was with Joe that we made a champagne compost near Stockholm, mm. which was a pretty full-on project. Yeah, totally. And made beautiful compost too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you turned your attention away from your business and started up a whole new company. Yeah, essentially having um, <coughs> um, uh, having met you and uh, being enlightened to the information that you share now on a on a daily basis, it really opened up another world for me in terms of how, as an arborist, I'd been dealing with the symptoms of um, of health rather than the kind of the, the the roots of health, if you will, to use a uh, to use an appropriate pun. And um, as an arborist, I really wasn't equipped with the tools of remediating plant health, and so that really opened up the avenue to you know, open up a number of tools for me to, to really build uh, build plant health in the soil. Up. Mm. What what was your journey then? I know you did Elaine Ingham's training. Yeah, she's been uh, kind of the foundation, you could say, of the work that I'm immersed in. But Elaine, of course, is a, is a microbiologist. She's not a soil scientist or a plant physiologist or a, a botanist or an arborist. So I've, I think um, one could say that I've kind of brought a, a, a plethora of uh, topics together to kind of synthesize some, some really important information that is on a cultural level is key to our... Um, our, our kind of entrance, if you will, into this back into the spirals of health. Mm. And what did that look like in the early days for you? You were doing a lot of like root injection work and yeah, trialing so, stuff. Yeah, right? so as the story goes, I had um, about a um, hundred thousand euros worth of tree in the trees in the ground that were that were dying, um, planted with um, very poorly engineered soil that we would as kind of standard working practice. Uh, and my uh, my hands as an arborist putting all of these uh, trees in the ground my 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 hands were really tied in terms of the uh, in terms of the potential to, um, to, to 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 establish trees based on the on the supplier and 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 kind of going into this world you realize that these big soil producers or compost makers have um, about as much integrity as um, I don't know you, you <laughs> I was going to say the English, but <laughs> that would be really, can't, can't, can't say that. <laughs> um, sorry, just a bit of a, a bit, a bit of sparring. Um, no, um, on, a, on a serious note. It was in the context mm. of, like, you were putting in a lot of parkland-sized trees, Yeah, right? yeah, like yeah. Large, mature yeah, trees with Yeah, so we're talking, like, root balls yeah, 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 exactly. So, so standard working practice looks at pit planting. You buy in large, um, large, um, large trees. This is These for, for context, mm. this is for, like, estate work where mm. people have an avenue of trees and they don't want to put a sapling in the ground. They want something to immediately Yeah, they want something. immediate, uh, immediate gratification, we're talking. So we're putting trees in the region of 1500 to, to 2000 euros a pop in in the ground using potentially um, 15 cubic meters of soil if it's if it's if you're growing in in, in poor um, poor soil quality uh, with the I suppose the hope that that, 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 that the plants will take uh, and they didn't so I was really scratching my head in terms of how I could uh, with with the perennial plants, I mean clearly you're 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 dealing with uh, a hidden root system. So so what what tools did I have available to to, to transform the, the the health of the plants? So I um, did an awful lot of research based on on Elaine Ingham's work. Uh, made a couple of machines based on um, based on a simple um, um, brewing system and root injector, which you um, might have seen on the channel. 
It was a few years ago now, but mm. Joe brought his rig over here when we had an internship running. Mm. Yep. You might have recognized Joe from some of the arborist work he's done here with working with our interns yep. as well. In uh, so I, um, I, I went away and made some high quality, handmade a high quality compost. I uh, made the machine, uh, made some extracts and um, uh, the, the transformation over a growing season was incredible. And that was, I guess, the kind of R&D, so to say. Is that um, with the root injection? That's with the root so injection. Maybe yeah. explain what that is to someone that doesn't know uh, much about it. So, so a root injection essentially is taking the microbes uh, from from compost because compost ultimately is a biological living system. Uh, I don't necessarily put too much energy or into, uh, and energy into or attention into the kind of chemical aspects of compost, uh, and those are made redundant essentially when you're looking at extracts. When you're making extracts, you're looking at taking the biology from this. Um, humic substrate, so to say, that then um, is, is, is brewed in a, uh, in a um, big tank of water. Uh, you're extracting the microbes from the compost into the water that then is just a carrier for, um, for, for getting the microbes in and around the root system of the plant. And that's essential, obviously, when we're looking at working with uh, perennial, perennial plants. So you've got this, like, Needle long needle injector that's essentially putting a compost tea or an extract down at the root zone. Uh, well, I don't know how big it. your meter is, but my meter is about about so big. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're talking about uh, we're talking about eight inches. Okay. Uh, and um, we inject that uh, we inject that living uh, living extract then in and around the root system under the um, drip zone of the tree that we yeah. call it, which is where the, um, the, the the density of fibrous roots are found, uh, and that um, is. Uh, like you could liken that microbial inoculation to something like a sourdough that's the that's that's the the, the kind of foundation of the um of the, of the microbial communities that a uh, we call it a later successional plant would uh, would enjoy in its kind of niche environment and those microbes were missing from the engineered soil that i was buying in so after doing the research and meeting you and really kind of going to the uh, the depths of the subject I found that that was the the, the missing link so we would have to um, we would have to go about and, and, and make that product and and uh, establish those microbes so that the plant eventually could take over and start building um, building fertility and so explain then what differences do, do you observe in that first season both after applying the extracts? Well that really depends on the health of the plant initially. There are very few plants that actually I have um, failed to, uh, or the microbes you could say, have failed to, um, to, to remediate. Um, so some plants are really stubborn. I mean obviously as the foliage of the plant dies back, which is uh, you're looking at kind of plant senescence, like the, 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 the foliage dies back, which is symptomatic of the root system also dying back. Um, you need to continually apply, one would need to continually apply these, these, these microbes to, um, to, to, to kind of intervene in some meaningful way so that you can actually um, encourage the plant to building, making sugars and, um, and, and then feeding the microbes there. So, um, fundamental to the health of the uh, health of the plant soil system. So, you, are you looking at like growth rates and plant vigor and health? Uh, I'm looking at uh, my. Uh, I'm I'm tuned into uh, density, foliage density, and leaf color and thickness. These are these are indicators for me. These are prime indicators. I'm not so heavily focused on um, on growth per se. Uh, what I what I want to do is look at um, a tree that quite literally on a physiological and, and, and physical level cannot fit any more leaf biomass onto its crown and a tree would only grow when it can fit more leaf biomass so to say so I'm really that's that's my focus of attention is mm. is, is growing plants with literally as much leaf as is possible and you know if that's the case and the leaves are quite clearly healthy in that case the, 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 the plant will be quite clearly healthy then the, 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 the health of the microbes and the health of the soil, which is ultimately a sum total of the interaction of animals and plants, um, uh, will also then be uh, in, a, in a peak state of health. And then you're in this uh, place of um, 
self-organization, self-optimization, which mm. plants inherently are, and it's only, I would say, it's only through our false assumptions on a, taking soil into like a chemical, the chemical domain that, um, uh, that we've sort of led us down this avenue of looking to try and cheat the system through applications of, mm. of synthetic fertilizers sure and then you have to support disease through uh, rather support the plant in disease through the application of pesticides and fungicides and nematicides and all the rest of it and i'm all i'm doing is basically building the the the, the, the structure of the, the soil structure so that the the plant can make best use of the um of the, of the minerals that are, that are locked inside yeah so very much in line with elaine's thinking of if you've got soil at all, you've got plenty of nutrition, and it's the life that needs to be put back in most cases. Yeah. So uh, my my uh, it's not only my 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 research, but my experience now tells me that the limiting factor in most growing systems is the capacity for soil to hold water, and that is always going to limit photosynthesis, since 95% of water is vaporized or trans trans is the technical term trans transpired through through that process. And so if water is the limiting factor, then your plant isn't going to produce uh, sugars. Uh, and, uh, and yet somehow we've got into our minds that perhaps, you know, manganese might be the limiting factor when actually mm. it's soil structure. Soil is a living system. It's a biological system that has been somehow interpreted as this kind of chemical... Um, um, Reductionist uh, sort of yeah, compartmentalised... Yeah, totally. There's very yeah. much a <coughs> compartmentalization process going on that is appealing to the um, to the kind of machine operator, uh, machine operator, I would say, and um, and and building compost and building fertility is very much a hands-on. My 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 own experience tells me that this is a hands-on approach that needs a dynamic kind it's of reciprocal yeah. uh, engagement that cannot be solved through mechanization. Yeah. So what is then the? Is there a difference between what you call an extract and a tea? Yeah, for sure. Uh, extracts are fundamentally just the biology, and teas are you would add um, you would add foods to the to the biology, and then you would apply that to the uh, to the foliage of the plant, uh, and the extracts are injected into the into the soil system itself. Okay. So and do you the do them in combination? Or yeah. So generally, I, I I operate a two tank system. So generally, when I'm a, when I'm treating plants, I would uh, root inject initially root inject the the the, the uh, soil with uh, with microbes the extracts and then um, second secondary to that I would apply uh, the compost teas which are the, the, the you could say the kind of shield of uh, of the leaf and the uh, above ground part of the um, above ground part of the plant uh, which are f vital they're fundamental to the uh, to the health and vigor of, of, of yeah. plants there shouldn't be any aspect according to Elaine uh, there shouldn't be any aspect of the uh, of the plant that is not coated in a in a microbial community yeah. of some sport beneficial microbial communities. Yeah, we talked about a lot how if you could take an electron scanning micrograph, your skin should be covered in microbes, mm. and likewise a tree in a wild habitat should also be like you shouldn't even be able to see the surface of a leaf, which is not the case in agricultural Sh soil. Sure. And I, I don't think that we give enough um, attention to the um, to the uh, toxins that are floating around the atmosphere that by definition of stripping um, plants of their um, inherent capacity to, to resist um, uh, pathogenic attack. Yeah. And this is really uh, important work that 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 we need to engage in in order to uh, promote the health of, of plants that we're immersed in whether we're eating or otherwise and my question has always been how are we people supposed to we humans supposed to optimize our genetic potential if you will if plants aren't doing the same and the very notion that you can go out and feed plants NP and, co NP and K and then go out and express yourself optimally like this is yeah. this is the um, uh, the uh, really, the um, emergence of a of a culture that is declining in health radi rapidly, mm. and uh, and I guess I built this company because I didn't I didn't want to be part of that destructive culture. I wanted mm. to actually bring some really important information to the fold that Elaine has spent her whole life working with, and 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 being in your company and in Elaine's, I just felt like 
This is information that the whole world needs to know about. Mm. This is a solution to agriculture. Um, we talked a lot about, we just had a, a training here and something I've always reiterated, but totally continuously now, it's like, hey, we're microbe farmers. It's like, you're not raising beef, you're raising microbes. You're not raising vegetables, you're growing microbes. And it's really the fundamental basis of our productions. So I'm wondering, like, for viewers at home who don't have fancy setups... Now, obviously, you've been talking about fungal oriented compost mm. for perennial exactly. work, but yeah, this yeah, can yeah. obviously be applied to annuals, too. Yeah. What would you say is the most easy leverage point for someone at home with a market garden or orchard or whatever that they can do at home scale for themselves? Mm. Like, I would say uh, making a high quality compost. So I, I, I see the majority of um, growers that I work with are firefighting because they don't have the robust communities of microbes that are necessary in order to look after the plant. So everything from weed proliferation right through to pathogenic attack, etc. These are all indicative of a deficient, um, uh, deficient soil food web. So. I, my own personal view is that we need to put far more energy and attention into the composting process uh, and if you can do that then you can leave us so much gains from really small amounts of compost. But it's using uh, teas and extracts. Using you teas mean? and extracts. So if you, 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 you if you lo were looking at a, thou a thousand liters a cubic meter of compost, for example, you can treat uh, you can easily treat a thousand square meters of growing systems throughout the season based yeah. on, on that if the microbial communities are there. And then all you need to do, I, th I always encourage people to look at uh, compost as a sourdough. And if you're applying the microbes, then clearly the microbes need to be fed. So mulching for me is a really under-practiced um, uh, phenomenon not happening in the in in the growing world. You know, that's the skin of the, uh, mm. the, the skin of the soil, so to say. So applying fresh residues in terms of grasses, green, green, um, uh, green materials, etc. These are really uh, important yet under-practiced um, um, ways of, uh, of operating that are by definition building fertility. And mm. that's the objective of our time, I would say. Like we've been depleting soil fertility for arguably 6,000 years since we invented the, the plough and we're still you know, we're, we're still using that. So going over to uh, ways of working that actually build life into the soil as opposed to destroying them. But the m majority of growing beds, growing systems that I come across are deficient in microbes. So by making the high quality compost and applying them through the extracts, which is simply done, a pair of tights would do, a pair of coarse tights filling the, filling the, the, the sack up with the tights up with, with compost. And then all, all you're doing is immersing the, the compost in water and rubbing out agitating the microbes, ag bit. agitating, and you'll get... And you can use a watering can, you don't need mm. anything more technical And we've had, uh, so, so the, the, the farm that I live and work on has transformed uh, a pretty redundant piece of land, silty piece of land with very or no soil structure whatsoever, with persistent applications of microbes, along with um, getting green growing plants into the uh, uh, in, in, into the beds and covering them with mulch that can look like a, a silage or a grass or hay or whatever you've got available. Uh, we've transformed this, this, this very poorly structured soil into something of uh, representing stable soil structure which is the indicative of uh, these, these relationships, these plant soil microbe relationships that are beginning to enter the stages of health. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what would be, like, what way of making compost do you think is mm. easiest for people to, to get engaged with on the home scale? So I think um, if, if time isn't a critical factor, I'm a believer in the kind of, um, I see a, a, big, um, a big proponent of the, the kind of lasagna style composting, of just adding layers with whatever materials that you have available. Um, I see a, a really big need for finding solutions that don't rely heavily on, on oil. Uh, so building um, small scale, small scale is absolutely the way to go. I, th I think quali quantity beats, sorry, quality beats quantity any day. Uh, so just one cubic meter layer, uh, one cubic meter of, of compost will really go a long way. 
but ensuring that uh, water isn't ever limiting because that's the um, uh, that's the n n necessary component for life to proliferate. It's coming down on us. Uh, and, uh, and 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 um, plenty of uh, diverse foods. If you have a diverse um, uh, population, uh, sorry, a diverse ingredient of foods, then you're going to be supporting a diverse population of microbes. So that could be like a Berkeley compost, like the rapid 18-day compost, like yep. we've shown on the channel. But it could be a slower pile, like at the end mm. of the market garden. Yeah, sure. So if you're, if time isn't a limiting factor, I would recommend the, uh, the, the, the the sort of lasagna style. If you really need urgently need a, a product quickly then the, the hot composting is, is is the way to go not letting the compost go above sort of 55 degrees celsius i would say uh, and uh, ensuring that the, the, the pile never um, the microbes never go without water yeah yeah and what about the Johnson Sioux method? That's something I've not got much experience with, but I know you've played around with that. I've played, played around some, somewhat with it. It makes a very um, a good quality fungal dominant compost. Um, and um, to my understanding is that it's uh, limiting, uh, it, it's, it's not so uh, resource intensive in terms of time. Yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a big consideration. What I, I mean, you're in in any business. You're always balancing and juggling equations, and time is inherently one of the uh, the, the biggest limiting yeah. factors. I, I just see, as you've rightly said, or that um, that compost really is central to any um, growing operation, and really needs that 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 credence, so to say. Yeah. So really, anyone on a pastoral level, through to a perennial crop to annual crop could be using this on a simple way that's not taking up too much time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I would uh, recommend just doing the uh, the research in the off season of looking at the, the varying methods because there is no one size fits all uh, solution. It really is dependent on the, on the context and the machines you have available, be them hand forks or, or, or front loaders. Yeah. Um, and applying a uh, different uh, different method for a different uh, different growing operation but uh, as i as, as i see it the and and my experience tells me that the majority of um, the majority of soils i come into contact with uh, are lacking they're significantly lacking um, organic matter mm -hmm. they've not been been fed and as a result the microbial communities have gone dormant or died so you need to replace the microbial communities in the form of compost or compost extracts. And then it's very important that these beds are fed consistently throughout the year and the, and the soil is never left bare. So and it's like a renovation project in the sense that, uh, like I'm in my mind I'm thinking of it similarly to using a broad fork. In the beginning we've used that in our no dig beds mm. to kickstart a process of change and now it's mm. totally redundant it's you can feel it's not doing anything and would you relate to putting compost teas and things in that way that you're you're doing a refurbishment and at some point if you keep the system fed and plants growing and roots in the ground as long as possible mm. then you don't need to be applying that anymore yeah absolutely um, I think our culture has normalized bare soil which is a really dangerous um, uh, a, a, a dangerous sort of normalizing uh, thing that we've done. Uh, so kind of re, uh, recalibrating our mindset to seeing that, or perhaps initially acknowledging that our food system is failing and then looking at what we can do to, 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 mm. to, to, to re-engage in a way that is again building into the spirals of health. And this looks like finding and building uh, systems, closed loop systems we might call them, to ensure that all organic matter finds its way back into the soil. I mean, that's the, the critical aspect of it. And we just cut off tons and tons of organic residue to the tip without mm. acknowledging its, its, it, its fundamental importance to the, uh, uh, to, 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 the, to the systems that we're a part of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So where is 59 degrees now? You're based over near Stockholm. Like, mm. what's your focus at this point as a company? Um, the focus, uh, as I see it, uh, in the long term is based on education. I, I see that there is a, a real need for um, uh, better building upon our foundation of knowledge. 
uh, to um, to understanding how we can operate um, more harmoniously in the landscape. Like our presence on the landscape currently is really destructive, mm -hmm. and that needs looking at. That's not something that on a cultural level is answered for us. We need to go out and find the answers. Sure. So 59 Degrees has really been inspired by that notion of, of, of me ultimately just looking at how can I be a force for good in the landscape. And that question in and of itself has led me to building a company and, and teaching growers and, and farmers and arborists how, um, how to build fertility. I mean, what we're after ultimately is stable soil structure. Mm. That's that. That's the the, the 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 end the end product, yeah. and that ultimately is achieved through the uh, through the building of microbial communities and the feeding and uh, weaning ourselves off the um, idea that we can feed plants synthetic uh, fertilizers. Mm. Mm. Well, one question that's going to come up, particularly amongst the market garden community. Mm is the lack of availability of good compost yep. in all over Europe it seems mm -hmm. as I'm interviewing people around Europe this summer mm. and obviously the way that we've been advocating market gardening with no dig is using mm. large volumes of compost particularly in the beginning mm. I would say our compost application now is probably less or no more than any market grower who's putting compost but just is tilling it in yep. and we've actually got our production of winter bedding to the point we don't need to buy in but mm. for those starting up it can be overwhelming to get enough material so what would you like how how do you foresee someone that wants to start up a market garden of sizable mm. you know for income like 1500 2000 square meters and wants yep. that big load of compost in the beginning mm. i mean my advice has often been just buy it because your time's probably worth more than that mm. but what gear would you need to make in the order of 50 to 100 cubic meters of good compost like how could someone do that for themselves what would what would you see as the minimum requirement to do that um I mean, 50 to 100 cubic meters is a lot of turning. That's that's kind of rules the uh, the pitchfork out of the equation. Um, so front see, loader only, really. Uh, uh, yes, but uh, but I see that the limiting the the, the limitations to that as, uh, uh, are um, the uh, integrity of the system. Like there are not many compost producers out there making anything of integrity. It is simply organic matter that doesn't have the biological communities that the plant needs. In order to in order to grow to to these peak states of health, but it's so. Do you think? Because I mean, that's been our approach: is buy cheap bulk organic material that's balanced nutritionally and mm. inoculate it with our own. Sure, sure. That's like, that's, that's that's probably the most economic. I, 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 yeah, I would say that that's the um, that's probably one of the better options. Or like even I, with a simple compost, because a lot of people have varying experience with some of it. Some people I know grow only with municipal compost, and it works great for them. And mm. others I know have dreadful yep. time with it and it obviously varies on the spectrum yeah it varies on the uh, on the processes of the um of the of the of the, of the producers of course and, uh, and the material. inputs like yeah. you know what what did they have at that time and i don't think that there are enough people that really understand the 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 the, the, the craft that goes into making yeah. compost which is the, the 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 niche that that we're filling but to answer your question i see that um I would say one take uh, biomass assays, so send them off to a local lab. There are a couple of people doing them in, doing that in Europe to see what is the biological and um, so these of are that like soil. the sort of Elaine Ingham based yep, exactly. soil science, mm. and you can find these on Elaine's website, yeah, yeah, can't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know there's some in the UK and Holland and places yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's one thing. If you can't get hold of any decent compost, I would use uh, preferably on organic cow manure. Uh, which is going to have a, uh, a rotten cow manure that is going to have uh, a significant um, kind of humic component. Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a movement against the word humus. I don't have an issue with it. I like the word, in fact, so so I continue to use it. But uh, and then inoculate that uh, that humus. What you need is basically a substrate. So before you apply the extracts, you need a substrate or a material that the uh, the microbes can use as a as a habitat and food source yeah. up until the plant starts to produce the sugars that are uh, that, uh, that, that are feeding the, the the microbial colonies so that's um, i also agree cow manure gives the best heart 
compared yeah, to yeah. any of the other manures, but other manures will do if that's all you've got access mm, to. Um, I just looked at a compost for a friend yesterday that he'd, uh, he'd taken on a material that was um, a horse manure that was full of uh, wood chip. And this is a, um, a really big problem. Uh, if, if the microbes aren't present to break down the sawdust, then you will get this nitrogen robbery that yeah. we talk about that is tying up the nitrogen that is going to go give you a whole heap of problems. So that material is going to need to be composted Aged properly before... Oh, well, I mean, that material, that, that horse manure was two years old and there okay. was no composition, there was no decomposition or evidence of decomposition whatsoever okay. because the microbes weren't present. Yeah. So I just informed uh, informed him that that... that, that um, uh, material would be make up perhaps 50% of his next compost that would need to be you'd need the, the the diversity of foods the diversity of microbes and then the uh, the kind of tending to the to the composting process ensuring yeah. that temperature and moisture were, were monitored throughout that process so people have options you you know it's probably most economic to buy in bulk organic matter and then treat it right Absolutely. And that could involve, uh, like certainly if your compost is still warm, like you need to compost that further before you put it on your beds. And you could be inoculating it in that pile, right? Mm. And then inoculating it again. How often would you say to someone to invest in inoculating that in the first year, say? Um, I mean, that really depends on the uh, on the food source that is is present, because obviously all of this life that we're uh, applying to the to the to the soil system is dependent on a food source of one sort or another. If the foods aren't present, then they will go into dormancy and they will wake up when when food becomes abundant again. Uh, so that that's a sort of open-ended question. But uh, what I would say is, in optimal circumstances, if you're um, if your your planting cycles are optimized, then perhaps just a number of a number of times, two three times, two, three times in, uh, in in in, in uh, quite short succession. I mean, the 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 objective really is to uh, install or or integrate uh, the the microbes uh, as quickly as you can, and then feed them and allow that process to. Um, uh, to, to, to kind of feed itself simply by adding adding the mulches so the the and notion the living roots of yeah of ab absolutely rapidly photosynthesizing yeah. plants absolutely and the, the the notion that we would continually need to buy in compost each year is um, um, is then redundant we can simply use the the byproducts from the uh, growing operation to, uh, to, 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 to 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 feed the growing beds um, and that's um, that. That's basically it. Nitrogen potentially can become a limiting factor when the when the seeds come into germination, which might need tending to. Uh, but other than that, I see that the nutrients, the nutrient availability, isn't limited by the parent material. It's limited by the microbial diversity, which ties in very heavily with Elaine's um, Elaine's work. Mm. So there's hope for you gardeners. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. just requires different work in different circumstances based on yep. where you end up and what you got access and I, to. I would say that the big, the best investment I've made on on um, uh, f in 59 degrees, apart from the knowledge that I've gained, um, is um, the the um, uh, application of uh, the, or the capacity to apply the products in liquid form. Uh, it just goes. Uh, one liter of compost can, can can be spread out over ten square meters, which significantly reduces the the need for low uh, low um, low quality uh, high volume products and um, time as well. Yeah, and, costs, yeah. and the microbes are going exactly where the plant needs it because the the, the water is acting as a carrier down into the um, uh, down into the soil system, which. Um, which is a really smart um, um, resource. Um, uh, uh, sorry, it's, it's, it's a smart way of working, I would say. Yeah. So it mm. doesn't need to be complicated. It can be done with a bucket and a pair of tights. And, and it could and be done as can. technical as you want it to be. Yeah, also. yeah. I mean, I only developed the, the machine that I did was uh, was because uh, I was dealing with thousands of litres of, um, of, of extract and it made... Um, it made sense to make the investment in a diaphragm pump, sure. uh, but but the more uh, sympathetic you are to the life in the compost, uh, the better the results. The yeah. plants are taking up the proteins; they're taking up chelated 
minerals held in this uh, in in the compost that um, that are, are left intact when you're really um, uh, massaging the compost as opposed to the kind of potentially the more aggressive ways of extraction through uh, through the mechanical means that I mm. use. Uh, so these are all considerations. I see that we need to look at life. Uh, sorry, look at soil as a as a living system, a living biological system and plant life that we see as a result of that, as a mm. symptom of that. And the healthier and more robust the biological communities, the healthier the plant. And we, as you say, we compartmentalize, we separate soil from root from plant, and they're all part of the same one system. Mm. And really integrating that into our knowledge base is fundamental to the transitions that need to take place. Mm. And that comes from you, you know, like I saw the... Um, the big picture through one of your lectures you know I just had this kind of eureka moment that I'd just <laughs> been sort of thinking about this all upside down and in this kind of isolated setting and and that really led me on to the to the to the journey that that, that I've been on for these number of years mm. nice. mm. so what's next for 59 degrees um, so we've been working on uh, developing a, um, uh, a compost hub um, what is a compost, a compost tub? tub? So this is a <laughs> 1.6 cubic meter container that rapidly decomposes organic matter through the uh, whilst uh, building the, uh, the, the 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 communities inside it. So they're using the, the the kind of starter, if you will, the really diverse spectrum of, of of species, microbial species that we're using. We put in the hub along with fresh organic material that decomposes under a very quick uh, in a really quick period of time uh, and we're left with a very high quality product that we can then use for the um, the teas and extracts so we've been developing this uh, this piece of equipment with a view to teaching growers like yourself how, how to, to use, use this uh, mm. because I see that that is uh, is a really critical um, missing link so to say in the uh, in in the chain of events that need to happen in order to build fertility into soil. Mm. So we're looking at um, moving away from the notion that we need to buy in big volumes of uh, low-grade product uh, and installing the uh, equipment to grow microbial indigenous or indigenous microbial communities in in their setting. Uh, um, and then extracting the microbes through the application of uh, extracts and teas. To so kind of close the loop on... Yeah, so Elaine has spent 20, 25 years in promoting a way of working, but we see that there's very few next steps in order for the grower to, to take in order to uh, utilise this really important science. So we've kind of stepped into that niche, if you will, mm. and said that this is um, this is something that, um, that, that, that 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 we can do that I've had a lot of success with. So I now teach growers and and farmers and arborists how to how to use this piece of equipment and uh, and get the best out of it. So where is it that people can find out more or get in touch with you? Um, so we. Um, um, we have a website, a very basic website that, uh, that can be uh, we can find find the contact details 59degrees.se uh, and um, and we have a YouTube channel 59 degrees soil where Octavia is presenting all of this uh, all of this work um, and an Instagram and a Facebook account uh, 59 degrees. We can stick um, them in the links below. Yeah um, and um, yeah and just get in touch. Uh, Awesome. Mm. Yeah, great. Thanks so much yeah. for joining us on the channel, Joe. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, the time. And I hope you folks found that interesting. You can catch us for another update from the farm very soon. See you in the next episode. <laughs>